Bien, je vous propose de, de commencer. Donc c'est un, un grand plaisir d'accueillir Laetitia Taruel aujourd'hui. Euh, Laetitia est professeure à Barcelone, à l'ICFO, euh, et elle anime un groupe extrêmement dynamique, on peut le dire, sur cette matière quantique. Enfin, j'ai beaucoup parlé de, des manips de Laetitia sur les gouttelettes dans, dans l'occasion de ce cours. Euh, bon, je crois que Laetitia, il y a beaucoup d'entre vous ici la connaissent, donc je ne vais pas le présenter pendant longtemps. Nous, on se connaît depuis bien longtemps. C'était son stage de M1, je crois. Tu étais venu faire avec David Gaëlin à l'école normale. Donc, c'est voilà, un certain temps. Après, elle a, elle a continué en thèse dans le groupe de Christophe Salomon, Frédéric Cheville. Et là, c'était le début de la transition BEC-BCS dont on a encore entendu parler. Donc là, ça a eu plein de très jolis résultats. Il y a eu aussi ce travail théorique que j'ai eu l'occasion de décrire fait avec Félix Werner et Yvan Castin. Et puis à l'issue de cette thèse, donc, elle est partie à Zurich, dans le groupe de Tillman et Slinger. Et là encore, ça a été un festival. Euh, bon, je peux juste citer deux choses. Il y a eu ces, cette réalisation d'un réseau, euh, réseau type graphène. Ce n'est pas vraiment un réseau hexagonal, c'est un réseau brique, mais enfin, donc type graphène. Et, et l'observation de pointes d'Irak, euh, typique de ces, réseaux, euh, de ces réseaux bipartites, avec la fusion des pointes d'Irak, leur séparation et tout ça. Il y a aussi des très jolies manips sur l'ordre antiféromagnétique qui pouvait apparaître dans, dans ces gaz de, de fermions. Et puis donc, euh, ça fait bientôt 10 ans, non Ça fait 9 ans que tu es, es à Barcelone euh, 8 ans. 8 ans Je crois que c'est 2013, non C'est 2014, oui. D'accord. Enfin, en tout cas, ça fait maintenant une petite dizaine d'années qu'elle est à Barcelone et qu'elle a fondé son groupe. Euh, et donc là, aujourd'hui, elle va nous parler de, 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 de résultats tout récents qui sont sortis sur Archive il y a deux jours. Euh, voilà, sur la théorie de jauge topologique. Voilà, et je te laisse nous expliquer de quoi il s'agit. Uh, so I will speak in uh, English. Uh, thanks very much, Jean, for the introduction. It's always so much of a pleasure to be back in Paris, especially after uh, these two COVID years and to see everything that is happening here. So thanks very much to everyone that showed me uh, their labs and discussed physics uh, yesterday. Uh, so I will be speaking today about what we did during this COVID time in my group at ICFO. Uh, in Barcelona, so we study Bose ice and condensates, and I want to show you how we manage to make them realize a special type of gauge theory, a topological gauge theory. So this is going to be a talk about Bose Einstein condensates. Bose Einstein condensates that we subject to artificial gauge fields, to an artificial vector potential from which you can get an electric field or a magnetic field, depending that you look at its time variation or at its curl. And this is, of course, a topic that is very old. It's almost as old as Bose-Einstein condensates themselves. So after getting BEC here in Paris, the first thing that was done was to set them into rotation. This uh, simulates a magnetic field and makes a beautiful vortex lattices appear. And this looks very much like uh, vortex lattices in type 2 superconductors. But there have been more and more methods to engineer these gauge fields for cold atoms. One very popular one nowadays consists on taking an optical lattice and shaking it um, uh, in a proper way. By doing that, you can actually generate a very, very strong uh, magnetic field that pierces the lattice, and you can even see directly cyclotron orbits of the atoms in there that can invert the direction if you invert the direction of the magnetic field. These are beautiful results from Munich, and you can even wonder what happens with these cyclotron orbits when you are near the edge of the system. So then you get these keeping orbits. So this is done using optical coupling between internal states of an atom uh, using so-called synthetic dimensions. This is something we like very much in Barcelona because it was proposed first by the theorist upstairs, by the group of uh, Maciek Levenstein. It's actually the type of method that I will be using in my talk. And yesterday, it was very nice to discuss with Sylvain uh, and see the beautiful experiments here on making the cyclotron orbits and seeing these uh, skipping orbits with these prosium atoms. But if you think of all these experiments, I mean, they all use different methods to make a magnetic field for neutral atoms. But while the particles are quantum, uh, all these gauge fields are always classical. So they are really some classical vector potential that you engineer with your preferred method. And that sets a background field that changes the motion of the atoms. Now what we want to do is to go one step forward and not have only quantum particles, but also try to make our gauge fields quantum. Uh, because if we think in nature, it's not just the gauge field that acts on the matter, but also the matter back acts into the gauge field. So ideally, what we want is to have gauge fields 
that are quantum operators. And if you think through that uh, as an experimentalist, the first thing that may come to your mind is to make what one calls a density dependent gauge field. So you say, well, I just then make my vector potential dependent on the matter density. Now, if the density is an operator, this will become an operator. I can derive some electric field, some magnetic field. And actually, there are very nice experiments going on in this direction in the group of uh, Cheng Ching in Chicago. This is a very recent result where they managed to make um, uh, such density dependent vector potential um, that affects matter and then matter acts back into the gauge field and they have domain walls that have very, very rich dynamics because of that. Uh, on the other hand, if you talk to your theory friends, they tell you, well, you want to make quantum gauge fields for quantum particles. Well, you have to look at the right quantum theory of fields. So you have to look at quantum field theory and what you need to do is to make a gauge theory. Yeah? And uh, I have to say theories, they can really be very persuasive because they tell you, well, you need to gauge your Bose-Einstein condensate speaking this quantum field theory language because if you can simulate gauge theories, then it's a theory of everything. So you can understand interactions between elementary particles. And also, if you are more into condensed matter physics, these are very powerful, effective descriptions of strongly correlated systems. So, I mean, better you get your quantum gases just speaking this language. So when they insist enough, then you start to wonder what you should do in the lab to get there. And I would boil it down to three ingredients. So the first thing is that you need to make a system that has both matter and gauge degrees of freedom. So you, in principle, need at least a two-component system. Then you want the proper coupling between them. And then uh, you need a system that has local conservation laws. So you need to make a theory that is gauge invariant. And maybe just to make these ideas more concrete, I like looking at quantum electrodynamics uh, because that's the gauge theory that we all know best. And uh, what you need to have is a matter field and a gauge field. You have photons and electrons. Then they need to be minimally coupled. So in the equations, you don't need to have the momentum of the particles, the P minus A. And then this local conservation law, what it is doing is that it's linking the gauge field to the matter field in every point of space and time. In every point of space and time, you really need to fulfill uh, Gauss law. And uh, this is actually the part that is hard to do in the lab because that means that if you have two types of particles, they need to have very constrained dynamics. If you change one of them, the other one needs to always change in the right way that you always uh, fulfill Gauss law. But uh, even though the experiment started with very small systems at the beginning, so first experiments had four ions in Innsbruck or like in Munich, in Zurich or in Heidelberg with uh, cold atoms in optical lattices, it was one side, two sides, four sides, or even there is also this experiment with Rydberg atoms that is very nice in uh, Antoine's group uh, at Institute Optique. This is three Rydberg atoms. Really, the experiments are now in the last couple of years reaching up to much smaller uh, system sizes. So people managed to simulate QED in one dimensional geometries with different platforms. So with ions in Innsbruck, they make the Schwinger model. Uh, neutral atoms in the PAN experiment in Heidelberg, they make a so-called quantum link model, also linked to uh, QED. And with Rydberg atoms in Harvard, in the looking group, they make uh, these uh, PXP models that is just a rough formulation of uh, QED. So experiments are really getting there. So one could really wonder, how do you mix these two areas of research? So we have, on the one hand, these density-dependent gauge fields. On the other hand, these experiments on gauge theories. And you could wonder, what is the relation? Is it really two separate areas of research, or are there connections? Or maybe, maybe in more concrete terms, the question that we ask ourselves is whether density-dependent gauge fields can, in some cases, be gauge theories, and uh, what are the conditions for that? And actually, uh, the answer is that, uh, yes, we can find a connection. And this connection is uh, best understood by looking at the effective field theories that describe fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, so really systems, two-dimensional systems of quantum particles subjected to a very strong uh, magnetic field. So we know that by doing that, when we go to the lowest Landau level, the kinetic energy is uh, very much quenched. So we have interaction effects that become very important. This is a very strongly correlated system, which has very nice uh, excitations, which are anionic. So if you take two of these excitations and you exchange them, uh, they don't behave like bosons or fermions but they get a statistical phase that is not zero or pi, but can be anything in between, so it's an anion. And uh, actually, this is a very complicated system to understand, 
but you can build a nice effective single particle description. This is precisely this field theory I was talking about, and it builds on the concept of flux attachment that Wittrek introduced, and it implies just taking this strongly correlated system and replacing the original particles by new particles that will be non-interacting, these uh, orange ones, and uh, the price to pay is that you need to have these new particles that grow up a part of the external uh, magnetic field uh, and attach to it. Yeah? So these particles, they get attached to flux tubes here and they form a composite object. Yeah? And now if you look at these composite objects, everything becomes intuitively simple, let's say, at the single particle level, because if you take two of these composite objects and you exchange, then you're also exchanging some solenoids, so that's where the phase for the anionic excitations come from, yeah, for the aronov bond phase that you get when you exchange the solenoids. And also, if you think of uh, uh, fractional uh, conductance plateaus, this is really like the filling of the Landau levels, but of the composite particles, not of the original particles. So this is really a nice theory reconstruction, and you see that a very important quantity in it is the magnetic field created by all these flux tubes. Um, and this magnetic field is proportional to the matter density because actually each particle will grab an integer number of flux tubes and how many flux tubes it grabs actually defines which fractional quantum whole state you are describing. Uh, and you see that, of course, this magnetic field, it's the kern of a vector potential of this gauge field. Yeah? So you can see that flux attachment is actually a density dependent gauge field, a particular density dependent gauge field. On the other hand, uh, flux attachment is also a local conservation law of a theory. This is the theory that describes the coupling of these red particles to the magnetic field created by these flux tubes, that is uh, the chern simons gauge theory. And uh, in some aspects, it's similar to electromagnetism, so you have matter uh, minimally coupled to a gauge field, but this gauge field is strange. It does not have its own propagation uh, dynamics. You can think of it as very, very, very heavy uh, photons. Um, so it actually gets dynamics, but when it couples to matter. So the equation of motion for this gauge field is exactly this local conservation law of the theory, this flux attachment condition. So when you change matter, the gauge field will change. But then you would think, OK, if I remove all matter, then this gauge field becomes trivial. Actually, this is not always true. Uh, this gauge field can have non-trivial solutions even in vacuum. Uh, if the topology of the space is non-trivial. And that's why these theories are called topological gauge theories. Yeah? Um, and what I will tell you in my talk is how we can simulate uh, in our experiment a minimal model of these type of theories. Yeah? And that's how much topology there will be in my talk. It's really just the, the name of this class of theories uh, that is like this. We will not be looking at uh, topology as we are usually uh, used to in cold atoms. So with this, I really come to the outline of my talk. So first of all, I will introduce the gauge theory that we want to study. That's the so-called chiral BF model. Then I will discuss how we can engineer it in our experiment using uh, optical coupling. And then I will also discuss how we can see its main uh, properties in the experiment. So what is the theory that we study? It's actually uh, related to chern simons theory. chern simons theory is a theory on the plane in 2D, and it's a theory uh, that you get when you reduce the system to a line, so basically to the edge of the system. And this is a theory that was proposed in the 90s by Silvio Rabello, and then was studied quite a bit by Roman Jakif and collaborators. Um, and what uh, ingredients it has are the following. So here in the chern simons model, you have a matter field psi and then a gauge field that has three components, temporal and the two spatial components. And now when I remove this y direction, I get a model that has a matter field, a gauge field that now can only have two components, a temporal and one spatial direction. And then the AY here, I turn into a new uh, scalar field that is called B because uh, as these are bosons, okay, this is also a boson. So the Lagrangian of the system is the following. You can see it here. Uh, the first term, that's a pure gauge field term. It uh, couples this bosonic scalar field B to uh, the electromagnetic field tensor that I would build from the gauge field here. Yeah. Uh, then this term reads BF. That's why this is called the BF theory. 
Uh, and then another very important gauge field term is the next one here. Uh, this is a self-dual term, uh, B dot B prime. And this term, uh, when doing this dimensional reduction, is then added a bit ad hoc, a posteriori, such that the, the gauge theory that you get uh, here in the edge really reproduces the behavior of um, the edge of the original 2D system. And if you want to know why this particular form is chosen and not another one, you should uh, really read the Jackie's papers that explains this uh, in very much detail. And then the other terms that you have here, you have a matter field that is minimally coupled to um, the gauge field, to the temporal component, and to the spatial component. And this uh, matter field, actually, because of historical reasons, that's how the model was introduced, is taken bosonic. So you can have interactions between these bosonic matter fields, and they are taken a polynomial in the matter density here. So now, once you have the Lagrangian, then everything is easy, because you can just uh, derive the equation of motion uh, for the gauge uh, field and for the scalar field. That's what you find here. And these are really the local conservation laws of your gauge theory. And uh, you see that uh, here, that's where you have your density dependent gauge field. So now we started with Trent Simon's theory, which has this uh, flux attachment uh, condition, this local conservation law. And then we reduce it to one dimension, to its edge. And then we get this condition on the electric field, not on the magnetic field anymore. Now, we want to quantum simulate this in our experiment. So we don't want a Lagrangian. We need a Hamiltonian instead. And also, we would like to have the easiest possible Hamiltonian to make in the experiment, of course. So we do a trick, which is uh, what is called encoding in matter uh, using the local conservation law. Uh, so that means that we will use this local conservation law to remove the gauge field and express everything in matter fields. Um, and then we need to get a Hamiltonian that is canonical and we can uh, quantize, of course, because we want a quantum Hamiltonian. Uh, so how to do this for these very constrained problems um, is not completely trivial. There is a very nice method from Fadev and Jakiv that is described uh, in this paper. That's what we used. And actually, we wrote a long uh, theory paper explaining how this works, because at least for atomic physics people like me, these were many new ideas. So we thought that it's useful to explain the method and also apply it to some examples that are um, of interest in our field. So just in a nutshell, to give you a very brief explanation, uh, what you do is that you redefine your matter field to eliminate this uh, gauge field. And at the end, you remove all gauge degrees of freedom, but you are left with a theory with new matter fields uh, that have an additional interaction term, new emergent interactions. And to maybe understand better what this means, it's nice to look at the example of QED in a line. So QED in a line is very easy because you don't have transverse degrees of freedom. Yeah? So you have no photons. Um, uh, and what you can do is that you can use a Gauss law to eliminate the gauge field and express everything in terms of the matter field. But this comes at a cost. And the cost is that you get between the matter particles Coulomb interactions. Yeah? And that's actually the trick that was used to simulate uh, the Schwinger model. So that's QED in a line in a lattice with trapped ions was to just directly engineer these Coulomb interactions. And if you do all this procedure right, actually you get gauge invariance for free because you really use gauge invariance to remove the gauge field. So if then you map, you realize on your experiment exactly the correct Hamiltonian, you have all the gauge invariance and everything you want. So we do this for this chiral BF theory, and this is the result that we get. So you see this is a quantum Hamiltonian. It has hats everywhere. Also normal ordering, actually these two points, uh, this is normal ordering for the operators. And it's actually very simple because we just have the kinetic energy. We have contact interactions uh, between these matter fields. But we get these new interactions, uh, which are the form current density. J here is the current operator for the matter fields. And uh, then uh, you could wonder what these uh, chiral these interactions here, these current density interactions mean. Actually, it's very easy to see if we go to the semi-classical limit. If we take a matter wave packet, uh, then the current is just velocity times the density, so h bar k over m times the density. And then the interactions that we need to me make are just contact interactions, but with an interaction strength that depends on the center of mass momentum of the particles. And this term is called uh, chiral. These are called chiral interactions. This is, again, a name from Jakiv. 
uh, because if you would put this theory in a ring, that would mean that your system has different interaction strength if the atoms turn in one direction than in the opposite one. And it's a funny interaction term we are not used to uh, because it explicitly breaks uh, Galilean invariants. So now I gave you this picture of this chiral BF theory built on a chiral interaction. So where is the density dependent gauge field here? You might wonder. Actually, if we go to the limit of uh, lambda uh, small, weakly interacting limit, then we can easily add a term uh, in lambda square because it would be very small. And this term uh, will be uh, density squared. And then we can gather this kinetic term, this new interaction term, and this additional term that we have, just put everything together. And then we can complete this square. And here you see, that's where your density dependent gauge field uh, comes. So actually, you can do things uh, more formal, of course. You can uh, check in our paper. Uh, what you get is that this chiral BF theory, you can see it in two ways. You can see it as matter with chiral interactions, or you can see it as matter coupled to a density dependent uh, gauge field. Actually, note that this gauge field that we get here, it's not the same as the gauge uh, field of the theory before all this encoding. There is just a numerical factor in front that you get when you do the calculation right. OK, and now why is this theory interesting? Why people in the 90s introduced this theory? Uh, actually, their idea initially was to try to get anion physics not in 2D, but in some simpler setting in a line. So make a theory for so-called linear anions. So these are fields that when you uh, compute their uh, commutation relations, they are not bosons or fermions, but they are something different. Yeah? Um, and uh, actually, this was proposed in the original paper. There were some mistakes in this paper. That's why there are many papers afterwards. They all discuss this thing. And then the conclusion was that uh, this is a field theoretical description of these linear anion theories that is correct. So if you take, for example, a well-known theory for anions in the continuum, that's a Kundu uh, uh, linear anion model, then it's a weak interacting uh, field theory limit is really exactly this chiral BF theory. Or maybe for cold atom people like us, we are more used to these Hubbard models and anion Hubbard models. Uh, then actually, if you take the anion Hubbard model and you look at the continuum limit and also weakly interacting limit, you get exactly this chiral BF theory. This was done, for example, in this very recent PRL. Uh, but actually, when uh, uh, all these discussions started on linear anions or, no, or not in this model, uh, what Jakiv noticed, and that's why also they wrote uh, papers on that, is that uh, this theory has a very interesting phenomenology in itself because it has solutions for uh, matter wave packets that would propagate without dispersion when they move in one direction, but not when they move in the other one. Yeah? So it has uh, chiral soliton solutions for the matter field, which are actually the, the, they are reflecting the edge states of the original 2D system, so they are really chiral many body edge states. And this is really uh, what is discussed here. So we thought this is a nice theory uh, to look at. So we tried to do it in the experiment. And the question is, how can you engineer this in practice in the lab? So we take a BEC, and we subjected it to two counter-propagating uh, Raman laser beams of cross polarizations. So these beams, they couple uh, two internal states, spin up and spin down, or blue and green in my talk, through a two photon Raman transition. So if you go the rotating wave approximation, you get this dispersion relation for the two states in the absence of coupling. And they are spaced by two times the momentum imparted by a Raman beam, because to go from one state to the other one, you need to absorb a photon and then re-emit it. Yeah? And this really gives you the natural momentum scale of the problem KR and also the natural energy scale. That's a recall energy associated to the Raman process. Now, when we put coupling, what we get are atom-photon dress states. Uh, so a gap that opens up here, and these two new states, uh, the dress states we call minus and plus. We will be focusing on the minus state in the rest of my talk. And if we make this omega large enough, then we get a parabolic dispersion relation. Uh, what is special in this dispersion relation is that actually the polarization, so the spin composition of this dress state, is momentum dependent. This I encoded in the color scale here in the curves. And this is actually very useful because now if I take the two parabolas and I put a detuning in my Raman process, so I make one lower than the other, uh, what happens is that my dispersion relation uh, just shifts to a side, and then I can mimic uh, static vector potential. And first experiments on uh, this 
old idea were actually done in the group of uh, Ian Spielman at NIST. So now how we go from these to a density dependent vector potential, uh, what we do is that we just put interactions in the picture. So uh, the up atoms, they have interaction uh, coupling constant G up up, the down atoms G down down, and just to simplify uh, first the idea, let's look at the mean field approximation. So that means that the energy of all the up atoms is shifted by G up up times the uh, density, and for the down atoms by G down down times the density. And here in this plot, I put them very different such that you can see the difference. And having them uh, different is actually the key point because if you have them different, then you see that your Raman process uh, will um, have a many body detuning that comes from the differential mean field shift of the transition. So you will have this detuning that will be proportional to density and to the difference in uh, scattering lengths. And that's going to give you a density dependent vector potential. And this idea is of course not mine. It's actually a nice idea from the group of uh, Patrick Oberg almost 10 years ago. And they also show that the Hamiltonian that you get in this system is exactly the one that I write here. And you recognize the chiral BF Hamiltonian, except that here you have uh, transverse degrees of freedom. Um, and actually to derive this result, they make two key approximations. So first one was really that you derive it in the mean field limit. Yeah? So what you get is really the classical version of this Carroll BF theory. And then the other thing is that you use um, adiabatic approximation in position space to do that. So you really need to have a very, very large value of the Rabi frequency. And actually when you put numbers uh, for that, it's like a hundred recoil or so. Uh, for the atoms that we have in our experiment, this gives us lifetimes that are so short that we cannot do the experiment. Uh, but still, uh, we thought, okay, physics needs to be continuous, so we need to connect to it in some way. And actually, we came originally to this problem from a very different perspective, um, from the perspective of the chiral interactions themselves, because uh, before the pandemic, we were doing experiments with RF uh, dressed uh, BECs, where we had two. Uh, internal uh, atomic states that we couple with uh, radio frequency. And what we measure was that the interactions of the dress states, they uh, were really depending on the polarization. So you can understand if you make um, a superposition of atoms with spin up, spin down that interact very differently, you can imagine that the superposition, if it's mostly made by atom of spin up, it will have mostly the scattering properties of the up atoms, the same for down. And then if you do 50-50, then you will have um, a dress state that has interactions in between. And also Thomas Baudel has been doing a very nice experiments on this here uh, at Institute Optique. So then our idea was, okay, we have uh, this. Now, if we do this coherent coupling between the two states with Raman transitions, you see that the dress state has a polarization that depends on momentum. So we should have effective interactions that also change with momentum. And now you see that if you put yourself in some part here in the middle of this curve, for any momentum that is in this region, the interactions, they really look like chiral because they are proportional to this momentum. Yeah? Uh, so you expect to get these chiral interactions and you get again uh, this uh, lambda term here will depend on the difference of the Gs here exactly as the density dependent vector potential that I was showing before. So we have a picture, let's say, uh, for uh, this Raman process, what it does, it makes chiral interactions. But this was the point where we were when uh, the lockdown uh, arrived. And we had these two pictures, this density dependent vector potential picture from the Oberg papers, and then this chiral interaction picture that we had in our lab. And we didn't really know how to get them together and also how we could make the Oberg people picture work in the regime where we can do the experiment. So actually lockdown was uh, good for this because it motivated us uh, to do uh, theory. And actually what we did was really to very simply write the interaction Hamiltonian of the system in the dress state basis. And now if you have a gap between the lowest dress state and the upper dress state that is big enough, and it does not need to be so big as you need for this adiabatic approximation to work, you can do well a truncation to the lower dress state. Yeah? And this actually is something that then we realized was done by the group of Ian Spielman in this uh, paper from 2012. And then the result that you get, you want to expand it in series because you want to really see uh, this linearity in momentum. So you do a series expansion on momentum around the point 
The nice thing is that the momentum spreads in the BEC, they are small, and the Raman uh, momentum is very large, so actually this parameter is small, and on top of that, in the series expansion, it gets divided by the gap between the two, between the two bands, so actually this is a small parameter, you can just truncate your expansion to the few first orders. And then when you do that, you really get uh, this uh, chiral BF theory, but there is a nice thing first now that it's in the quantum regime, so we really have operators everywhere. Yeah? So this mapping really extends. And also, uh, one thing that we like as experimentalists is that the result that we get is valid for much lower values of omega, especially some that we can access in the experiment. And the price to pay, because of course there is always a price to pay uh, for everything in life, is that we have to replace the mass by an effective mass and actually we recover the over results when this effective mass becomes equal to the real atom mass. Huh? And uh, not only that, here I derive everything for zero detuning of this uh, Raman process, but we can also put some um, single particle uh, detuning, and then we get this uh, static vector potential I was talking about before, and uh, provided we choose a system where the polarization is zero, and for any momentum you can always find a detuning that makes this condition work, then this vector potential does not depend on momentum to first order, so we can gauge it away, and then we again get uh, just this uh, chiral BF theory. So with this, uh, we were happy because we thought, okay, now we understand things, we have a nice physics picture, we can do numerical simulations and control everything, and we were even happier because the lockdown uh, stopped, so we could go back to our lab here, this is our potassium lab at ICFO, and uh, what we do here are uh, Bose-Einstein condensates of potassium-39, and potassium-39 is a very nice atom, uh, because it has tunable interactions with flashback resonances, and we can turn these tunable interactions into the chiral interactions of our problem. We take these two spin states, uh, the two lowest uh, spin states, at high magnetic fields around 385 Gauss, uh, because there uh, the scattering lengths uh, are the following. So we have one state that is in the flank of a flashback resonance, so we can tune it um, in a broad range. Uh, that's the green state. Then the other state has very small scattering length, and we can even choose if we put it positive or negative. It's a uh, few A naught. And then uh, the interactions between the two states, they're also very small, they're slightly attractive. Now, how do we do the experiment? So we make our BEC, uh, we make a strong uh, flashback magnetic field with this uh, Peter electromagnets here. Then uh, we confine the atoms with an optical waveguide transversally, quite strong, because we want to look at effective 1D physics, 1D dynamics, because this chiral BF theory, it's a, it's a 1D theory. And then we put Raman beams that are aligned in this uh, axis, counter-propagating. And uh, we also have in our experiment a high numerical aperture length uh, with which we can observe in situ the system. So all experiments that we do work in the following way. We first prepare the atoms in a Raman dress state. And then at t equals zero, we will remove the confinement from an additional beam that I did not show here. And then let atoms evolve in this waveguide and look at them uh, with our lens. So now, uh, what's the first thing we want to do? Is to see these chiral interactions. So we prepare atoms into this uh, Raman dress state. And then, at the moment, when we want to start the dynamics, what we do is that we add a couple of uh, Bragg beams with which we are going to kick the atoms to prepare different momenta to see that the physics depends on the momentum. So we can actually, by choosing the detuning of these beams, either kick the atoms to the right or kick the atoms to the left of the dispersion. And then uh, we just let the atoms evolve with this momentum that we have imparted in the waveguide with the Raman beams on and take images. And this is what you see in the experiment. So this is what happens when we kick the atoms to the right. And you see that the atoms, they are not confined anymore longitudinally, so they start to expand in this waveguide. While when we take the atoms and we kick them to the left, we see that they maintain this sh their shape. There is no dispersion. So we understand actually very well what happens in the system in the terms of the effective interactions, because in this case, when we kick right, we make a system with repulsive interactions, that's why it expands. And when we go to the left, the system is effectively attractive, so this attraction is compensating for the dispersion. 
So if we look at the longitudinal sizes, it's even more clear that the two directions are very different. So we have really made a chiral system concerning interactions where the left and the right propagation directions are different, and they are different at the many-body level, let's say, at the interaction level. No? And you also see that when we go to the left, there is really no expansion at all happening. Uh, the cloud is self-bound, and this is because we form a bright solid. And really, the attraction exactly compensates the dispersive effect of kinetic energy, and then it makes this self-bound uh, state. So in my group, we like very much self-bound states, so we wanted to understand what is different on this one compared to other self-bound states that we have done before. So for that, actually, we wanted to know whether this is a chiral soliton, like the theory says. Uh, what we did is a very simple experiment. So we just put a wall and check what happens when we launch this soliton against the wall. And of course, we don't make a wall. We put a blue detune laser beam. We have another high NA objective from the bottom. So we focus a beam here tightly on the side of the BC. And this is what we see. So we see that our soliton happily comes to the barrier. It compresses a bit when it arrives here. This we all understand. We can do simulations on that. And then when it comes uh, back, it disappears. It really, uh, bouncing off the wall, kills the soliton. And then we get an expanding uh, gas. And you could, of course, uh, wonder whether it's really the system uh, that does it, or something weird is happening with your barrier. So we are experimentalists, uh, so we always want to check everything. So we took another spin state, put very similar attractive interactions, launched it against similar barrier. There are just a few tenths of Gauss in between these two experiments. And we see that normal solitons made of just single component uh, BEC with attractive interactions, they just bounce nicely through the barrier, and they remain solitons. But when we do it with this Raman dress system, uh, really, this does not happen. So we have a chiral soliton, so a soliton that only exists uh, for one propagation direction. And you can think of it, uh, that's uh, like the field theory vision, like a big particle that actually only exists in one direction and it disappears in the other one. And we can also use our theory we know, uh, to know whether this mapping to this chiral BF theory is correct in the regime where we do the experiment. And we actually find that all the data that is here, it's very, very well described by this model. So we think that we have done really these chiral uh, solitons predicted by uh, Jackie in the 90s. Huh? So now, uh, this is the chiral interaction picture. Uh, we saw the chiral solitons, so we were very happy. But then we said, OK, but where is this density dependent gauge field? Uh, can we also get information on this density-dependent gauge field picture from our experiments? So how can we observe this chiral BF gauge field? And you could think that this encoding trick that we use of removing the gauge field uh, kills the problem because we remove the gauge field. So how are we going to get it back? So actually, what we do is that we use the same trick as uh, the ion experiments of Innsbruck uh, used, which is to use the local conservation law. We know this relation between the gauge field and the, and, the, uh, and the matter density, so we can use it to reconstruct uh, the electric field. And uh, you see that we are going to get, in principle, an electric field generated by the system itself when we change uh, this matter density. Yeah? So for seeing it, actually, uh, what we do is that we let the cloud expand, because that's, in our experiment, what we can do that make the biggest change in the matter density. And we want to see that the gauge field appears or that the system is behaving as if it was subjected to some uh, new uh, gauge field. Uh, and actually, this is what we do in the experiment. So we take the atoms, Raman dressed. Now we are in the ground state of the system in the minimum of the dispersion relation. And we simply let them expand and see what happens. And these are the images uh, that you get. So this is expansion in the waveguide with the Raman beams on. And you really see that initially this looks like a standard BEC. But then when it starts expanding, something funny happens. It gets this long tail to the right uh, hand side. And you see it directly in the uh, uh, pictures. But you can see even better if you just uh, integrate these density profiles along the transverse direction. These are fits to these density profiles from the experiment. And you really see this long tail appearing here. So what is happening here? Actually, if you think microscopically of your atoms with their scattering lengths and so on, uh, it's very simple what is happening. Because we start with our wave packet, and now when the atoms start to expand, we know that the spin composition is linked to the momentum. So this, the green atoms will fly to the right. The 
the blue atoms will fly to the left and they have different interactions. So after a while, you, what you see is that actually some go further than others because some have more interaction energy, let's say, to release than others. That's why you get this tape. This is really the microscopic picture. But once you are into the dress state, actually the atoms, they should not care if they are uh, blue or green up or down. So how can we understand this uh, in the dressed uh, state basis? Actually, we understand this exactly, this electric field uh, here. So what happens is that when we let the atoms expand, the density drops in the center and increases in the edges because we need to fulfill continuity equation. But in the edges, um, the atoms will just move more in one direction than in the other. So you have a distribution of electric forces no? linked to the changes in uh, density uh, with time that is different in different parts of the cloud. So for one part of the cloud, these forces, they, they pull in this direction. Here they push in this other one. And this distribution of electric forces is what distorts the cloud and makes it uh, become asymmetric. And actually, this is very hand-wavy picture, but we can take our model and really compute and see if it holds. And this is uh, what we get. So here, the dash line, maybe don't see it very well because it's just almost on top of the solid line. This is full uh, gross PTAF scale equation simulations of all our system with the two components, the Raman beams and everything. And then the solid line, which is much easier to compute, this is just a simulation of this effective chiral BF theory, just the Hamiltonian, the effective Hamiltonian we derived. And you see that they agree uh, very well for this range of parameters. And you also see that from the effective model, we can get this electric field in every point of the cloud. And these are these arrows that we see here. And you see that these arrows, they really show this distribution of forces. And that's what changes the shape of the cloud. Yeah? So just our take home message is that then when we look at these images, we need to look at the asymmetry of the distribution. For that, we use the skewness parameter, which is just uh, the ratio of the third central moment to the second uh, uh, central moment cube. And then um, we just can see uh, if the skewness parameter is different from zero, we have an asymmetric distribution. And here for tails to the right, uh, the skewness parameter is positive. So then let's analyze this data more in detail to see if we really, how big is this asymmetry. Uh, so that's telling us how much of this electric field we have. So this is what you get in the experiment, this QNS parameter versus time of expansion. And these are really the points. And the line is the numerical simulation, no fitting parameters. So we were happy. Everything agrees very well. But again, we are experimentally. So we said, well, one set of parameters agrees very well. But maybe let's look around a bit different uh, parameters and see what happens. And actually, this was a drama in the lab. Because when we change a bit parameters, suddenly the asymmetry is completely gone. And I have to say that we did not understand for a while. It's gone, um, but it agrees very well with the numerical simulation. And the thing that we change between these two experiments is just the detuning of the Raman beams. And then we realized that actually our effective theories also predicted that. So we understand things very well, because actually there are two contributions to this cloud asymmetry. One are the chiral interactions. That's the effect that we want to see. That's uh, what is in the gauge theory. But there can also be kinetic effects uh, if the effective mass uh, depends on momentum. And this is something that the group of Peter Engels has been studying already for quite some years. Uh, because you can imagine if your atoms are effectively heavier when they go in, move in one direction versus the other, then uh, I mean that's also going to skew your distribution. Yeah? But that's not the effect you want to see. And this is exactly uh, what happens in our case. So the skewness from interactions is always positive. But if you put the tuning negative here, these kinetic effects, they make positive skewness. So both effects conspire in the same direction. So it makes a lot of asymmetry. You are very happy. But if the two effects go in opposite directions, then, of course, you kill uh, your effect in the expansion. Uh, and then we looked again at our effective theory. And you remember I told you, well, we can map into this chiral BF theory. But just for some set of parameters, we need to make sure this polarization is zero. Actually, this polarization is zero. Uh, it's just the condition that kills these kinetic effects, these terms that are not in the gauge theory description. But when we go here, we still see something asymmetric. So this made us happy. Uh, because we can go in a regime where we realize this chiral BF theory, we see these asymmetric expansions. So we conclude that actually we can also infer this chiral BF electric field. 
And with this, I really come uh, to the end of my talk. So I told you a story today about simulating gauge theories, simulating a very special type of gauge theories, which are topological field theories, which are actually a nice particular case that merge uh, these fields of density-dependent gauge fields and the simulation of gauge theories. Of course, not any density-dependent gauge field is a gauge theory, but they are special ones uh, where this density dependence is the local conservation law of a gauge theory. And this is, we did a special case of that. And actually, this uh, particular guide, type of gauge theories, you can uh, realize them um, by using this local conservation law and then simulating only matter fields. But the price to pay is that you need to engineer some new uh, interaction terms that can be uh, non-trivial. Uh, for the theory that we made, uh, the chiral BF theory, which is a dimensional reduction of chern simons theory to a line, uh, these interactions are chiral. So that's something we can do in the experiment using uh, Raman coupling in a BEC uh, between two internal states that need to have very different interactions. We can make them with uh, potassium 39. So we can see these chiral interactions. We can see uh, chiral solitons, which was the main prediction of this uh, gauge theory from Jakiv. And we can also see the self-generated electric field. And if you are interested in this, uh, we have an experimental paper that just explains uh, the results from the lab. We also wrote a long theory paper to try to really clarify uh, this um, uh, relation between density-dependent gauge fields, gauge theories, how we do all this encoding, and so on. So this is really for the brave people to read. And uh, now what do we do next? I have to say, from a personal point of view, I think what is a bit of a pity still in these experiments is that we made all the mapping and all the effort to be able to derive a quantum model. But then, at the end, everything that we measure is very well described by GPE simulations, and it's just mean field. So we would like to push this to a regime where quantum fluctuations are important. Uh, we are not sure yet how to do that, but we think that in this system, we also have almost canceling mean field interactions, so we should be able to see beyond mean field effects, and maybe that's the way of seeing that. I have to say this is my very personal uh, uh, motivation because I like these quantum fluctuations and so on. I'm a bit biased. If we think from the picture of gauge theories, uh, actually there are three directions that I think are important. One is uh, to think about the connection of this model with linear anion models. That's how the model was first introduced. And I told you there are nice theory works uh, connecting the anion Hubbard models in the lattice that are proposed in literature. To my knowledge, no one has done an experiment yet to this continuum uh, realizations. Now we think we should do the other way around. So take our Raman coupled system and so on, put it in the lattice and see what happens and whether we can do experiments in a one dimensional lattice and really make connection uh, to this. Then another thing that we feel is really important and we did not address here is that these uh, gauge theories, they are topological and their properties depend on topology of space and so on. And we did not see any of that because we made the model in a line and the line is topologically trivial. Yeah? So the question is, uh, can we do the model in a ring? Because then uh, you can have, you cannot remove completely all the gauge degrees of freedom. You will have some magnetic field that pierces the ring that remains. And then you expect to have different topological configurations associated to this magnetic field that appears. And there are nice predictions that in this case, you should have persistent currents that depend on the magnetic field. But now, when you change your atom number, this effective field changes, and then these currents will change. Yeah? And uh, there are ideas on this direction from the group of Patrick Oberg. And actually, they even give some recipe that could be done in the experiment. So instead of using counter-propagating Raman beams, you just need to do the experiment with uh, Raman beams that give orbital angular momentum. And then you will get this funny system with chiral interactions where basically atoms interact differently. They turn like this or they turn like this. So this is something we think could probably be done in the experiment. And then I think the big goal is to try to extend these schemes from one dimension to two dimensions. This is the problem of all these experiments simulating gauge theories. Everyone is restricted to 1D because it's much easier, but we want to go beyond that. And in our case, that would mean uh, engineering Chern simons theory. So there is also a recent proposal on how to uh, do that in the experiment. OK, this is in a regime and with some conditions we really cannot do. But we think that by combining these two approaches, we have some ideas how we could twist things in this direction. 
And we think this is actually an interesting approach because everyone wants to see a fractional quantum whole state and get this anion physics from taking an interacting system, subjecting it to a strong magnetic field, and then this, get these anions coming on themselves from the strongly correlated system. Yeah? But you could also think of engineering directly the gauge theory, and then you would get in a very weak interacting setting the anions that come just because you made the effective model, and that's a different way of looking at things and also maybe a good way of uh, developing observables or just thinking of the system. And uh, with this, I want to show you the people that uh, did these experiments and also the people that I hope will do the future ones. So this is my group uh, at ICFO. Uh, everything that I talk about today is done by the red people. That's the potassium team. And it's really these uh, two PhD students, Annika and Craig, and two postdocs, Letra and Ramon, that took all the data and made all the simulations that I've been showing. And in the very early stages of the experiment, pre-COVID, Fesar, that's a former student of the group, was also participating on all that. And uh, all this is really the PhD thesis of Annika. So if you want to know about experimental details or things like that, you should really uh, check in her thesis. She's defending in a bit more than a week. And now we have an open position because she's leaving us. So now we need a new potassium team member. And uh, this is all the experimental side of things. But you see in my talk that there was a lot of theory involved. And this is uh, thanks to Alessio Celli that took all these hand wavy ideas that we had on chiral interactions and density dependent gauge fields and help us formalize that and make things uh, clean. And now this was actually a very fruitful collaboration. So we started a common project together and we have common theory students where they are mostly his students. Uh, and Claudio is working on these ring ideas right now. Giuseppe, that's a postdoc. He just defended his thesis. He's staying a bit longer. He's looking at the lattice things. And Julia is also a PhD student. She's looking at gauge theories, but with strontium atoms, uh, because this is the other half of my group. That's the blue people. You recognize some people here for sure. And uh, what they are doing is they are uh, setting up a, a strontium uh, microscope experiment, uh, so strontium in a lattice. And there is a person actually here in this uh, slide. I realized that uh, I did not put a picture uh, off, but I should definitely thank. That's Maciek Levenstein, because Maciek was really the person getting interested in simulating uh, gauge theories with cold atoms. And he pushed this idea on all of us. Actually, he even convinced Alessio to change from high energy physics to cold atoms, join our field. And uh, really, I mean, we would not have done these experiments without him, of course. And Maciek is always full of energy, so now he set up some consortium for a Quantera project that will start in September for more gauge theories with cold atoms. So he has a lot of energy. He called this dynamite. So he told me, well, he's looking for a dynamite postdoc. So if you're interested in doing theory on this, huh? no experiment, you should write to Maciek and to Alessio. Hmm? And uh, with this, uh, uh, merci beaucoup. <laughs>